Romans chapter 12, very familiar and too often forsaken verses in the scriptures. Romans chapter 12, we begin reading verse number 1. The great apostle Paul, inspired to pin down these words, said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the house of God. Thank you for the people of God. Thank you for the mercies of God. And thank you for being so kind and so good to us, even on this Lord's day. Now, Father, we do thank you for good reports from the jail services. We thank you for a good Sunday school hour. Thank you for the youth choir singing, the congregational singing. Thank you, Lord, that we can be in your house on this Sunday morning. Now, Father, I do pray for Miss Sonny. You touch her and help her. I pray for Miss Natalie and her upcoming surgery. You'd be with her and help her. Father, we do pray you'd use Brother Doug today in a mighty way. And I pray that any in his family that aren't born again, that today would be the day of their salvation. Uh, Father, I do pray for those that are traveling. I pray for Brother Bobby. You'd touch him and help him there in the hospital. And I pray for Brother Spivey. You'd be with him and that, Lord, your perfect will would be accomplished. Now, Father, for the next few minutes, we ask you to put a hedge about us. We pray you'd bind the powers of hell. And I pray that, Lord, uh, you would speak through this unworthy servant. I pray the word of God would become alive. And I pray that your people would receive it with gladness. Uh, I certainly pray to congregation this size, if there's any that does not know you, as Lord and Savior, they're strangers to the grace of God. Uh, I pray the sweet Holy Spirit of God would touch their hearts. Uh, God, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Uh, Father, have your will and way. Uh, get glory to your name. We'll bless you and praise you for all that you do. Uh, Father, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. Uh, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus uh, we do ask these things. Uh, amen. And amen. Uh, I, I, I just want to look at some things about the Christian life today, and we'll primarily be preaching to Christians. Uh, but if you're here today and you're unsaved, you can be a Christian. Uh, God came seeking to save that which was lost, uh, and Jesus uh, uh, paid your sin debt on the cross of Calvary, uh, and he longs for you to be a child of God. Uh, but uh, as we uh, read this text, uh, uh, we find that this, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that by the mercies of God, and by the way, we can't do anything without God's mercy, uh, without his help, and without his touch. Uh, but I want to deal with some things, uh, and he deals with this text, he deals with presenting yourself a living sacrifice. Uh, and I want to deal with uh, uh, sacrifices uh, in, uh, uh, in accordance to the Christian life. So the Christian life embodies, first of all, a life-changing sacrifice. Uh, can I say, uh, when Jesus Christ became the propitiation for your sin and my sin, uh, when he gave himself on Calvary, when he emptied himself of his life's blood, uh, when he uh, 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 was crucified, uh, when he was buried and rose again, uh, he did all of that uh, to give us a life-changing experience. Uh, it's called salvation. Uh, and that life-changing sacrifice on Calvary uh, some 2,100 years ago uh, was done that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, and any that truly have been born again, their life has been changed. Uh, uh, we went to Christ as a sinner, uh, and we met him, uh, and he changed our life, and we exited uh, that encounter being a saint of God, a child of God. Uh, he changed me. I'm no 
longer what I used to be, uh, and I praise the Lord. The Bible says uh, in Ephesians 5 and verse number 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, uh, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, uh, and hath given himself for us an offering uh, and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling savor. Uh, it was a life-changing sacrifice. He was the sacrifice uh, and our lives were changed. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, it says this in verse 19, uh, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, uh, which is in you, uh, which you have of God, uh, and ye are not your own? Uh, he changed my life, uh, and he indwelled me. Uh, he lives in me, and what a blessing. Uh, the Bible says, For you bought with a price... Uh, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Uh, he saved me, uh, and he bought me. Uh, he paid my sin debt. Uh, he paid a debt that I could never pay, uh, and he canceled my debt to sin. Uh, therefore I am now a servant of God, uh, and he owns me, because uh, he paid for my sin. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, says, Therefore if any man be in Christ, uh, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I'm glad I'm not what I used to be. I used to be a, a, a child of the devil, a sinner by nature and by practice, and I was headed to hell. But I'm glad for the day Jesus saved me some 49 years ago, and he put a new song in my mouth, put a new direction in front of me. I'm no longer going to hell. I'm going to heaven. And hey, the journey's been sweet all the way along. Uh, Miss Annette and I was, uh, uh, took a drive yesterday and we were driving. She said, you realize everything we ever desired, he's give us. Uh, what a God. What a God. Huh? It was a life-changing sacrifice. When Jesus sacrificed himself, he did it to change our lives. And it changed mine. Has your life been changed? If you met Jesus, you got a new life. Can I say, uh, not only does the Christian life embody a life-changing sacrifice, can I say uh, it embodies a living sacrifice. We find here in verse number 1, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If the life-changing sacrifice was salvation, can I say the living sacrifice is submission? Can I say that uh, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice? I've heard people, Brother, Brother Ed, all my life say, uh, I'll die for Christ. He don't want you to die for him. He's the one that died that we might have life. He wants you to live for him. And we're to present ourselves a living sacrifice. Uh, can I say this is a conscious act? You present your body. You make that choice that I'm going to live for Christ. Amen. Can I say it's not always popular living for Christ? Amen. Jesus said he didn't come to bring, a, bring peace but a sword. And he went on to describe that there would be enmity between husbands and wives and fathers and sons and mothers and daughters uh, because those that do not know Christ do not understand us that do know Christ. And they don't, they don't always understand and most of the time don't agree with some of the stands we make. And can I say, it is a conscious act to present your body. Have you ever presented yourself to Christ? So well, I got saved. That's a blessing. But since you got saved, have you presented yourself to Christ saying, I want to be a living sacrifice. I want you to live in me so others can see it. Amen. Now, he had no idea what I was preaching on, but as we shaking hands, Brother Phil said, let me tell you something that happened to me. He said, I was over at Sam's filling up uh, 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 my, my car with gas. And he said, this fella come by and said, you look like a nephew of mine that I just saw in a coffin the other day. I don't know what that says about your looks, Brother Phil. <laughs> I've seen some folks in a coffin. They don't usually look very good. huh?" But him and Phil got to talking, and Phil got to talking about the Lord. And all of a sudden, some lady come by and asked him to pray for her. 
Then another lady come by and asked him to pray for him. Some guy said, hey, it kind of got on around here. What happened? He long ago presented himself as a living sacrifice, and God used a comment about a fellow's nephew who died recently to impact other people's lives. I told Brother Phil, I said, if you'd been living like a heathen this week, that wouldn't have happened. Mm. Uh, it is a conscious act to present yourself. It's, it's beyond salvation. This is when you come and say, Lord, I'm submitting my life to you to be a living sacrifice. Can I say it's not only a conscience act, it is a constant attitude. A living ING. That ING means this is a progressive work. It's a continuation. You can't live for Christ today and that be good enough for tomorrow. It is a conscious, constant attitude uh, that you're going to live for Christ every day. You're going to sacrifice the things that your flesh wants to do in order to let Christ live through you. Mm -hmm. It is a constant attitude. Something you got to deal with every day. Mm -hmm. Can I say this? It is a common sense abandonment. He said it's reasonable service. Can I say, living for Jesus is not difficult. Amen. God does not expect you to do beyond what you can do. Amen. He just wants you to do what you can do. Right. And do it to the best of your ability. It is a common sense uh, abandonment. I'm just going to do what I can do for Christ. Miss Marcy, he doesn't expect me to do what you can do. He expects me to do what I can do. And thanks be unto God, he don't want me to do what Mary can do. Huh? I'd hit every yard sale in town. Huh? But anyway. I'm just trying to say it's a, it's a reasonable thing to live for God. It's not a hard thing. Can I say living for the devil was hard? Living in sin was hard. Huh? Can I say the Bible says the ways of a transgressor is hard? But can I say, uh, the Lord said his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Uh, can I say it's a joyous thing to live for the Lord? Uh, uh, so the living sacrifice deals with submission. A life-changing sacrifice deals with salvation. But then I thought about the Christian life embodies a loyal sacrifice. Verse number 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you've heard me preach enough to know that the battle's in our mind. That's where the devil attacks you. And you have to renew your mind. How do you renew your mind? Through reading the Bible, through talking with the Lord, through meditating on the Lord, uh, through putting things in your mind that are good and peaceable and acceptable unto Christ. Uh, he said, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, can I say, uh, loyal sacrifice deals with being sold out. Yeah. Amen. There are some Christians that just want to dip their toes in it. I just want to get close enough to the fire. But you see, there's no Bible for that. You either got to get in the fire or get away from the fire. Hmm. And God help us to have some folks that just get all in, sold out for Christ, huh? Can I say, uh, Galatians 2.20, my life verse, says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Not yet, uh, not yet I, but Christ liveth in me, uh, and the life which I now live in the flesh, uh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In my Bible, right next to that where it said he gave himself for me, I wrote my name. Uh, I'm glad he gave himself for me. If I'd have been the only one that believed on him, he'd have still died on the cross of Calvary, uh, and I'm glad he gave himself for me. Uh, if he gave himself for me, why would I not give myself for him? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, the Apostle Paul says, I protest your, by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. He said, I die daily. And Paul gives us the key to living a sold out and submissive life to Christ. You've got to die daily. I was reading this week some things, and I read this illustration from A.W. Milne. He was a missionary uh, who left uh, 
to go to the South Pacific. And he went to an island that was nothing but headhunters. And can I say, every missionary that went before him was killed by the headhunters. So when A.W. Milne decided it was time to go, he took all of his earthly, earthly belongings and he put them in a coffin because he knew he wasn't coming back. Can I say this? Uh, long before he ever went to die in the South Pacific, he'd already died out to Christ. Now I'll say this about A.W. Milne. He went to the South Pacific, he went to the village of Headhunters, and he spent 35 years there. When he died, the tribe, buried his body in the center of their village, and they inscribed this on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. Because he had died before he went. And he changed that entire village and that entire continent. We're still talking about him today. He buried everything he had in a coffin because he'd already died. I'm going to preach with God's help for a few minutes on this thought. I want to preach on coffin Christians. Coffin Christians. Uh, can I say we must be placed in our spiritual coffins in order to impact this dark world. We live in a dark world. Can I say uh, 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 darkness is growing every day. But can I also say, the Bible makes it clear, darkness does not overcome light. Light dispels darkness. Uh, and that's why Jesus told us, uh, a city on a, on a hill cannot be hid. Uh, and we're not to take our light and put it under a, a bush or hide our candlestick. Uh, but we're to let our light so shine that the world may see our good works uh, and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Uh, but can I say, uh, uh, the world's getting darker because we haven't died to self and sin and to Satan. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, filled our spiritual coffins in the right manner. Uh, and we're not shining our light before this dark world. Uh, can I say, many Christians act like world, worldly people. The same thing that upsets them upsets you. You know how to get some help over our wicked government? First of all, do you real good to look at some real wicked governments? But best thing you can do is look at our heavenly government. Can I say everything's well in heaven? Can I say everything's good around the throne of God? Uh, and can I say I can't get through at the White House, uh, but I can bow my head toward heaven and I get through to glory. Uh, and God hears every prayer uh, and He answers every prayer. Uh, you see, we spend too much time looking around instead of looking up. We spend too much time thinking on earthly things instead of heavenly things. Uh, and it's all a di direct result of the fact we haven't died. Oh, we've died out to sin. We're saved. But as far as submitting and being sold out, we didn't sign up for that. Oh, we're happy to live in our life the way we want to. Uh, and Brother Ron, uh, it's not my notes, but I might as well go here. We've got it in our mind that the things of God come second place. Uh, oh my. Hmm? Can I say, I knew some folks when I was growing up, and I won't mention their name because you know who they are. They believed your tithe and your offering was you, you paid all your bills, you did everything you wanted to do, go to all the entertainment, and at the end, if you had a dollar left, you put that in the plate. Oh See, God came second. Yeah. They didn't bring their first fruits into the house of God. And can I say that there are folks uh, uh, that think that church is optional and living a Christian life is optional. If we can just fit it in, uh, it's okay. Uh, uh, listen, we're not impacting our world because we haven't died, my dear friends. Can I say, I used to work at a funeral home. There's one thing I know is about dead people. They don't say anything. They don't object to anything. They just do what dead people are supposed to do. 
Mm. You know how I know a lot of people haven't died? They're not doing what they're supposed to do. Amen. So what are we to put in our coffin so we can be a light to this world? Can I say, first of all, we need to put our flesh in the coffin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All of our desires. Yeah. Can I say this as kindly as I know how? God don't give a flip what our desires are. Right. Our desires are to be Christ. He don't care about our desires. And why in the world are you caring about your desires? You realize a hundred years from now, everything you're sold out to is going to burn up and it won't matter. A hundred years from now, we'll be in glory. And the only thing that's going to matter is what we've done for Christ. Amen. Tell it. a preacher yesterday, I said, I hope my life, when it's all said and done, has made an impact on somebody else's life. I wonder why we can't grasp that God is serious about His business. Because a lot of people aren't serious about God's business. But God is. Let me read you my last verse again. I am crucified with Christ. I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You see, when you haven't died and haven't submitted and sold out to Christ, you're doing the living for you. But when you have submitted, uh, you let Christ live for you. Uh, you go where He says. You do what He says. Uh, he becomes Lord and Master of your life. Uh, there's a lot of people that are saved. They know Jesus is Savior. They just don't know Him as Lord. Uh, We've got to put our flesh in that coffin. The apostle Paul dealt with that flesh in Romans chapter 7. He said when I would do what's right, I don't do it. When I do, when, I, when those things are wrong, that's what I end up doing. He said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Uh, when Paul said to the church at Corinth, I die daily, uh, Paul knew he had to crucify his flesh every day. Had to put in that coffin every day because uh, this flesh, the arm of flesh will fail you and lead you astray. Our flesh has to go in that coffin. Can I say this? Uh-oh, this is going to get me in trouble. Our feelings need to be put in a coffin. We have a hard time as individuals separating fact from emotion. That Bible's the facts. That's the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. That's why we don't want to hear the truth. That's why we want to have singing all the time. Why we want a modern Bible. Why we don't like old-fashioned preaching. Why we like a little sermonette. Why we like a little fella that's got sissy skinny jeans on sitting on a stool uh, telling little humorous stories. Uh, we don't want to hear preaching because uh, we don't want to hear truth because uh, truth deals with our emotions. Uh, it deals with our flesh. Uh, and we don't like it when our flesh is nailed to the wall. Amen. And our feelings are too much involved. Boy, if I had a dollar for every time I hurt somebody's feelings while I was preaching, I'd have a whole lot more dollars than I got right now. Uh, God don't care about your feelings. He gave us emotions, but they're to be used for His glory. But everybody gets their feelings upset when, when you say something a little bit too close to their flesh. You've got to learn to put your feelings, your emotions, in the coffin. Hmm? Listen, Brother Doug, I'll tell you something, and you know this as well as I do. If I'd ever had a pastor call me in and tell me I wasn't acting right and chewed me out, man, I'd want to get underneath the church. Are you listening? Yes, sir. Uh, you know what I'd do? I'd have hugged his neck, told him I was sorry, and I'd have stood up, told the church I was sorry, and I'd have esteemed that man of God and been thankful he told me the truth. Right. Nowadays, preacher preach the truth, people get mad and go to some other church. Right. 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 Hmm? Huh? I want to tell you something. If a pastor ever called me out, I'd have been embarrassed for my own actions. Amen. And I'd have been embarrassed for the Lord. Right. And I'd have got right. I'd been thankful for it. I want to tell you something. My pastor is retired from pastoring, but if my pastor called me today and said, Preacher, you need to do this, you know what I'd do? I'd do what he told me to do out of respect. He's my pastor. 
Say, well, you're not under him anymore. Oh, but listen, let me help you something. If it wasn't for that man of God, I wouldn't be who I am today. Huh? But, oh, our feelings get involved. They need to be put in a coffin. Can I say this? Our fancies need to be put in a coffin. Our preferences. Hmm? Can I say there's a whole lot of preachers that preach their preferences? I don't really give a rip what somebody's preference is. Huh? I care what Jesus said. He's got some preferences that we're to seek Him first, that we're long to please Him, uh, that we're to walk circumspectly, uh, that no corrupt communication come out of our mouth, uh, that we're to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present day and age. God's got some preferences, and those can preach to me. But our preferences? I know I've heard preachers say you've got to wear a white shirt when you're preaching. I'd be in trouble today. Hmm? Uh, I've heard preachers say if you don't go to the barber every two weeks, you're out of the will of God. What if your barber's on vacation? Some of you go, go a couple months. Uh, but I'm telling you, they preach their preferences. Uh, listen, there's a difference between a Bible conviction and a personal conviction. If it says so in the Bible, it better be your conviction. But if it's your personal conviction, who cares? That's between you and God. Uh, let me pick on somebody I ain't picked on. Brother Baker, you've been coming here long enough. Used to, I tell you, if I didn't pick on you, it's because I didn't like you, but I can't pick on everybody. But I get you, Fred. Now listen, God's given you a beautiful family. You're the head of that household. Now, if God burdens something in your heart for your household, who am I to say what my preference is for my household? That's between you and God. You're the head. So that's your job, not my job. So I'm not going to tell you how to run your household. Okay? Uh, I will tell you yours. <laughs> Get rid of the cats. Uh, by the way, when I ate Miss Toey's food the other day, when I stuck that fork in the chicken, it did not meow. It was chicken. Pick on her too. But everybody's got their preferences. They need to go into coffin. Because you're never going to serve God living on your preferences. Hmm? Well, what is providentially hindered? Probably what you're thinking it not Providence is hindered when you can't. Yep. Amen. Not when you choose not to. Right. If you need that expounded on more, see me after service. You know what else needs to go in that coffin? Our frills. Yeah. Our entertainments and our ease. I'm amazed at what some people will miss church because they just need to get their mind uh, at ease and they got to go ride a roller coaster or something. Uh, you know what the Bible says in Amos chapter number 6? Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. We've let entertainment rule our households. Mm -hmm. You know what the Bible says about idols? Not to have them. And yet... You've let your children base their life on a show called American Idol. That ought to speak to you right there. Anything that contradicts the Word of God, you ought to run from it. Right. Amen. We need to put our frills in the coffin. There's nothing wrong with riding a roller coaster, but there's something wrong with riding a roller coaster when it comes before the Lord. There's nothing wrong with entertainment, but there's something wrong with it when you put it before the Lord. I enjoy being entertained. I enjoy it. When we take a cruise ship, I go to all the shows if I like them or don't like them. Why? I paid for them. I'm going to go watch them, huh? But listen, there's nothing wrong with entertainment in its right place. There's nothing wrong. Out of everything comes blessing and cursing. You've just got to learn to discern whether or not uh, God's getting glory from it or not uh, and where to put God first in it all. Mm, a lot of people are letting the frills rule their life. They need to go in the coffin. Our fatuity or our ego and conceit need to go in the coffin. I'm getting ready to go to a meeting down in North Carolina. 
I don't know how many preachers. Last time I went to a meeting that I didn't know, there was 105 preachers sitting there. There'll be more in this meeting. And I sit back and watch and laugh at some of these big dog preachers coming there and think they're it. And when the day of judgment, there's going to be little grandmas and grandpas and nobody ever knew their name, got up 4.30 every morning, called on God and called out men of God and called out missionaries and called out sinners and those people did more for God than that big dog preacher ever did. Right. And they're going to be in the front of the line getting the, the rewards. But anyway, it amazes me how much ego is in the ministry and how much politics are in the ministry. And how much ego we have when it comes to serving God. Well, I can't do that. That's beneath me. Let me help you something, preachers. If you're not willing to clean a toilet, God's not going to bless you to stand behind a pulpit. Hmm. Can I say, I've cleaned a lot of toilets around here. So how come you get to do all the preaching? Well, first of all, I'm the pastor. But second of all, I've cleaned a whole lot of toilets around here. How many of you clean? Been a lot of times I've been out sweeping the floor late on Saturday night. There's been times I've mowed the grass. There's been times I've done a lot of things around here. And there's been times I've done things around here you would never known anything about it. And it doesn't matter because I wasn't doing it for you. But I'm saying this, if you've got an ego, I won't go preach in a nursing home. Well, shut your Bible. You don't need to preach at all. I won't go preach at the jail. Shut your Bible. You don't need to preach at all. Huh? By the way, right here, if you won't go preach in the jail, go preach in a nursing home, you're not going to get to preach behind this pulpit. Because those people's souls are just as important as anybody else's. Hmm. Well, we've got to put our ego and our conceit. People sitting in church, well, I won't sing with them. Uh, what happened to the days a bunch of folks just got together and got to singing, and all of a sudden it sounded good, so they got up in church and sang it? Yeah. Hmm? Boy, it got real quiet right there. You might have too much conceit in your singing. Huh? Listen, where's Bella at? Hi, Bella. How you doing? Bella wanted to play the violin because her buddy Nas played the violin. So I bought her violin for Christmas here a couple years ago. She gets up on Sunday night. She plays. She don't hit a note one that's right. And there's times it sounds like cat, uh, Thad's cat's getting stuck over there in a furnace or something. I don't know. But she's playing the strings off of it. Yeah. And it might not sound good to us, but you know who it does sound good to? The Lord. Huh? And can I say every musician that's on the platform on Sunday night will sit down before I have her sit down. Because I know why she's playing. There's, there's not too many people in this church that love church as much as Bella loves church. I'm just saying we need to put our conceit in the coffin. Can I say this? We need to put our fondnesses in the coffin. Anything that we love more than we love Jesus, you've got to nail it down. You've got to put it in the coffin. It's hindering you from shining his light to a dark world. Last thing, I'll be done. We need to put our fears in the coffin. Can I say a man a lot smarter than me once said, fear of loss is greater than fear of gain. You know why you don't do anything for Christ? Because you're afraid of how you're going to look doing it. Right. You're afraid what you may have to give up in order to do it. You're afraid of the stand you may have to make. You know what you need to do? You need to put all your fears in the coffin. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd rather look like a fool to the world and be right in God's sight then the world never know I exist and God look at me like I'm a fool. Hmm? A lot of you fear things that don't matter. Let me ask you this question. Has God ever failed you? Has God ever not taken care of you? Has God ever forsaken you? Then why are you afraid of something? Some of you are afraid of something today. You're afraid of an outward influence that is causing you not to serve God. Amen. You say, how do you know? Because if you're worrying about it, you got sin in your life, you got sin in your life, you're not serving God. Because worry is a sin. Anything that is not of faith is sin. That's what the Bible says. You need to put that fear in the coffin. 
I'm going to say this, I'm going to be done. The altar is a place where something dies. Everywhere in the Bible where you see an altar, they brought a sacrifice to the altar and they killed it on that altar. The altar is a place where something dies. The altar is the coffin this morning. Those things that you've got that are hindering you from being a light to this dark world, you need to come bring them to the altar. Put them, up, put them, put them to death in the altar. Now I know there are circumstances in your life that you can't control but there's nothing in your life that God can't control and he has the answers for the things that are hindering you from being the light that you need to be you just need to put them in the coffin say here it is Lord this is bigger than me I can't control it but I'm submitting it to you I want to be a living sacrifice I want to count for Christ uh, I want my life to make a difference uh, Lord here is everything I have you can have it Lord uh, all I ask Lord is you just show me what you want me to do now if you'll give your life to Christ like that today as a child of God there's no limit to what he'll do in your life he may never call you to be a missionary, may never call you to be a preacher, may never ask you to do something in front of a congregation, but he will use you to impact somebody else's life. And can I say, when it's all said and done, that's the most important thing that can ever be said of you, that God used you and it helped somebody else along the way. You may be here today and you may be lost. What you don't understand is you're dead to God. And the only way you'll ever get life and get born again is to come and give your life to Christ and today we're going to give you an opportunity say I don't know how to be saved you come we'll get somebody to take a Bible show you how to be saved you can be saved today but child of God we're not seeing people saved because we haven't put our lives in the coffin I'm wondering today will you be a coffin Christian will you die out to yourself that Christ may truly live through you to impact this world there's a lot of talk of some of the goals we want to have, we want to do around here we'll never get anything done as long as we're trying to do them but if we'll die out and put everything in the coffin there's no telling what God will do far beyond our goals but it's up to you and I will you make that conscious choice that I am going to become a living sacrifice and that starts with dying out to myself. Today, God's looking for some coughing Christians. Let's all stand, Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. The altar's open. There's no more time for playing games. This thing's winding down. You can make an impact for Christ. It starts with dying. If the Apostle Paul had to die... How much more do you and I? Folks are coming. They're coming to get a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for the grace of God. Lord, we know that in ourselves we can do nothing because you said without you we can do nothing. But we know through you there's nothing we can't do with your help. So, Father, I pray, folks, now, realize their need to die out to those things that have controlled their lives and live as unto Christ. Lord, I fear there may be somebody here today not saved. God, I pray they'd come. Can somebody take a Bible and show them how to be saved. They can be saved today and their life can start counting for God. God, have your way now in this invitation. Speak to hearts. Bless these who are on the altar. Help them, Father, in Jesus' name. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.